So uh, for the long time, we've been trying to uh, better uh, tailor the treatment according to patients' true risk. And, and as I mentioned, uh, even within those categorizations, uh, there is uh, considerable heterogeneity. And so uh, I was at the ASTRO meeting a few years ago when Dr. Spratt uh, first presented the data that you showed. And I took a screen grab and, and uh, when I returned to the, to the office, I, I looked at those six uh, uh, categories and asked myself, how would I treat each of the patients in those categories differently? And, and that's where uh, we go in the next slide. You see, I, I kind of came up with a decision tree based on those risk categorizations. So patients who have uh, low risk disease uh, and uh, NCCN low risk and a decipher low risk, uh, if you sum those numbers together, you get zero, obviously. They're very low. Um, uh, and uh, what I was thinking is that those patients should best be managed by active surveillance. But if uh, they were unwilling to consider a surveillance, uh, we would offer them uh, radiation therapy in the form of either uh, external beam treatment or brachytherapy, monotherapy. Likewise, the patients who have um, uh, low risk disease and uh, an intermediate risk uh, to cipher score, we would give them uh, monotherapy, uh, either a radiation loan or brachytherapy. But again, many of those are also candidates for active surveillance. But when we get into that challenging group of the intermediate risk uh, uh, cases with either favorable intermediate or unfavorable intermediate, that's when uh, we're all challenged to ask ourselves, when is the uh, appropriate use of hormone therapy? And I thought the uh, scores that uh, uh, Dr. Spratt uh, put forward would be helpful. And so uh, we continue to offer uh, monotherapy for those patients who have that sum score of two, favorable and intermediate risk. But when they have unfavorable and intermediate risk, uh, we consider a short course of engine deprivation therapy, four to six months. And of course, men with high-risk disease, uh, today we still offer them a long-term engine deprivation. And for the very high risk, uh, I, I uh, encourage, of course, all patients to consider clinical trial. But for those patients with the very high risk, uh, we were at the time exploring adjuvant therapies like chemotherapy or some of the new novel anti-angine therapy drugs. So going to the next slide. So this is uh, an, another uh, interesting presentation. Younger man, 46 years old, uh, PSA uh, 10, uh, a pyrads lesion of five with strong evidence of extra capsular extension on uh, the MRI. And you see the uh, image that we acquired from this gentleman. And seven of 12 cores were positive uh, for four plus three. Um, so he uh, has NCCN unfavorable intermediate risk disease based on that high uh, Gleason score four plus three and an MRI that was uh, concerning. And so uh, this young man, uh, 46 years old, was concerned about being on hormone therapy for uh, two years. In fact, he was concerned about being on hormone therapy, period, uh, uh, didn't want any. Um, and I was very concerned about his pathology and his MRI. Uh, and you obviously couldn't feel this on a, a digital rectal exam because this appeared to be an anterior lesion. So um, we sent his tissue for decipher. Next slide. And I was surprised that it returned at a, a low risk, 19% um, uh, risk of higher grade disease on prostatectomy. Uh, uh, just a 3% risk of metastasis at five years and 3.6% uh, risk of cancer death within 10 years. So uh, quite a discordant uh, finding from uh, the pathology, the PSA, and the MRI. Uh, next slide. So um, here we have, uh, uh, given his um, MRI findings, we considered him to be uh, very high or high risk with um, T3. Uh, so we gave him three points for that, but zero points for the decipher, and he comes into the unfavorable intermediate risk category. And um, he was very uh, willing to consider a shorter course of uh, ADT and, and uh, along with IMRT. So go to the next slide. So I brought his case uh, back to our multidisciplinary GU tumor conference for discussion because I, I just uh, found it uh, 
uh, unusual to see such discordant results between pathology and decipher. And our radiologist there uh, was a different one than uh, the, the one that read the original report. And um, he felt that he wanted to look at this a little closer and uh, felt that there really wasn't any evidence of gross extraprostatic extension. And he shared this with other radiologists um, who were more experienced with uh, MRI, a uh, prostate MRI. And uh, there was disagreement as to whether or not that represented a true lesion uh, when they looked at the uh, multi-parametric imaging. And so, uh, this is a situation where actually Decipher uh, forced us to re-examine some of the clinical uh, findings. And uh, next slide. He really didn't have the, the uh, T3. It was really, really more like an um, unfavorable intermediate risk uh, with um, a low Decipher. And so um, looking at the, the data from uh, R2G9910 uh, from Dr. Bozanski, we felt that four months of adrenal deprivation Entry deprivation therapy would be sufficient for this gentleman's uh, disease. I want to thank you, Dr. Mahalski, for your time and presentation, and thank the attendees for, for joining. Thank you, Ryan. It's been my pleasure, and they were great questions. I appreciate the participation.